with David J. Maloney. This week, David talks with the indie alternative dance band EMF. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome to everyone at home, and I would normally say our studio audience to the weekly show. I am your host, David J. Maloney. Uh, I say normally because we'd usually shoot the show before a small studio audience at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, uh, but we are still shooting from home due to coronavirus concerns. Uh, we do hope to gain clearance to get back to our live to tape shows real soon. So, uh, President Biden just recently toured the Ford electric car plant in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, and he was very impressed with the technology. Uh, the last time he visited a Ford factory, it was assembling Model Ts. In a viral video, former child actor and star of NYPD Blue, Ricky Schroeder blasted Costco for upholding the California mask mandate. Uh, on camera, Schroeder demanded a refund of his membership fee. But the good news is, he kept his job in the stock room. <laughs> and a Las Vegas strip club is the site of a pop-up vaccination clinic where customers who get vaccinated receive free lap dances. After three days, they've already given over 10,000 shots to 300 men. And the Gulf Coast states have uh, now fully lifted their COVID-19 mask wearing mandates, or as Governor Kiyavi puts it, going commando face. Let's see, on Instagram, uh, Demi Moore's daughter, Tallulah Willis, said she punished herself for not looking like her mom. Uh, ironically, her mom doesn't even look like her mom. And did you hear this? A Utah woman who didn't know she was pregnant went into labor and gave birth on a flight from Salt Lake City to Honolulu. Great, another screaming baby on an airliner. I wonder if she was sitting in C-section. And lastly, uh, Georgia has been invaded by Argentine giant tegu lizards, uh, which eat small animals. Zoologists say the deceptive predators trick their prey into believing they can save them money on car insurance. On tonight's show, we chat with the mastermind behind the British rock band with one of the biggest personalities of the 90s. Their song, Unbelievable, charted across the world and helped them become a number one band in the US. Tonight, we welcome Ian Dench of EMF to the show. So don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back. And we are back. Uh, our featured guest tonight helped create and is an integral member of one of the most successful British crossover bands of the 90s. Uh, their stage presence and stories of their touring days are, are legendary with fans and those in the industry. Uh, and their songs have never lost their playability. Please give a warm weekly show welcome to EMF founder and guitarist Ian Dench. Ian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for your great intro. <laughs> so um, EMF was a staple in the 90s, and, and I've been hearing your music for, for decades now. Um, but a lot of people don't know about you guys as band members. Um, if I'm correct, most of you guys were, were, were you guys from a small town? Yeah, we come from a, um, a, a little town in the middle of a, of a huge forest in, in the sort of west of the UK. Um, and uh, I was the only member that wasn't actually from that little town. But uh, it, this, the town was very famous. Um, I, I came from just outside um, but this town was very famous because uh, it was sort of a, how do you put it? It was a, it, it, it was a little bit like a, you know, the, the the deep south, the Appalachian Mountains of the of the UK, where and and, uh, uh, and so you know there were lots of stories about the people from the Forest of Dean being slightly uh, um, um, how, do you, how do you put it interbred or oh geez, and there was a lot of sheep around there, so. So there are a lot of stories. So, so uh, when I got to know the, the, the other members of the band, I was slightly uh, apprehensive. <laughs> but it turned out that it was all it was it was completely untrue, and that uh, they, they were actually very very uh, compassmentous and, and uh, very um, uh, lovely and very talented. And I met James, the singer, in a in a music shop in Gloucester, where I came from, and. And uh, um, and he would he'd said to me, um, oh come come and hang out in in the forest sometime. You know we have great fun. We 
we did this, we got this band called EMF and we had a rehearsal uh, and and we played death metal and, in Afghan coats and the fire brigade got called out in our rehearsal. It just sounded like great fun. And and um, and uh, I'd been in a local band and I'd actually had a record deal. And so, so you know, I'd never sold a record, but in... Um, was that Apple Mosaic? It was. Yeah, it was. With, well, you've done the research. And, yeah, and that was uh, Honey If, right? That's right. That's which we released, and sadly we didn't sell a record. But it was a good, it was a good training ground. And and uh, when I met the boys, we just started writing songs together. How old were you when you got signed with Apple Mosaic? Uh, what was the story behind that band? Well, uh, I was twenty-one when that got signed, and I'd been working on that for a long time. And um, you know, I sort of made every mistake in the book with that band. You know, we. We had an offer from Rough Trade because it was a sort of cool indie band, and we had this offer from Rough Trade to sign to, to Jeff Travis, who was an it was an icon in the music industry. But then our manager got an offer from Virgin Records for a lot of money, and he's like, "Yeah, go for the money, man!" And um, and we and we went for the money, which is I think was a big mistake. And then they tried to produce us this way and tried to make us do this, and and I said, "I I really want to do something like with." dance beats and guitars and he's like no you can't do that you've got to do one or the other and you know this was a time when when the smiths and eck and the bunny one were, were doing great things with guitars but public enemy were, were were being played in de la soul and we started to hear these beats and we just sort of as many young kids at that time did you know they we were listening to lots of different music and we wanted to put it together before all that is it true that your father taught you classical guitar yeah that is true how does that kind of fit in with where you ended up, or does it not? Well, that's very interesting that you ask, because I would say that the guitar riff in Unbelievable has a little bit of my dad in it, because the way that the... Um, uh, I'll show you, I'll show you. Um, so the way that the, um, uh, that the riff goes... It starts off with with a bit of blues in it because I love blues music. You know, I, I used to listen to The Doors and um, and I worked out all the guitar solos and it goes sort of... So you hear the blues in that. But, I, you know, I spent my life listening to classical music, which comes, a lot of it, from Spain and it comes from flamenco music and it has the, the darker... Um, key in it and so the second bit of the riff is I can hear this coming so then there's the flamenco in it so I think that definitely did have an influence and I love it that my that my dad's in there somewhere along with all my you know the music I loved and from the bands that we used to play and when we used to play the blues and yeah so you guys were signed fairly quickly after forming um, I mean, kind of, what, what's the story there? I mean, did the record company call you? And, and what sold the band to them so quickly? Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Apple Mosaic because I'd struggled away for eight years in, you know, in, in that band and, and made a lot of um, contacts along the way. I think people saw, oh, maybe they're going to be something, and then and it wasn't really. And But hence, I had a few numbers to call, and I can remember calling uh, our uh, A&R guy, and saying, you've got to come and see this band. And he, he came down to the Forest of Dean to watch us play. And, and afterwards, he was like, he's like, don't tell anybody else about this. You know, don't give it. Because I think he saw that there was something special there. And, um, but a couple of more people heard on the grapevine. And, and all of a sudden, we had all these offers. And it was, you know, having struggled away for eight years in my previous band, all of a sudden, just the stars aligned. And, we, and within six months of forming, we had a record deal. And, and with a year, we had a hit record. And in a year and a half, the record was number one in the States. So it was a meteoric rise um, to, to stardom. And I, I still can't quite believe how it happened. And it was very exciting. And, and I, I, I want to ask you about that in a little bit. But one of the things, while we were on the topic of the different band members, I know you've said before that each of the different band members kind of adds a different flavor in the creation process. Do you remember any specific notable additions or changes that... A, a member made in that sense we when we went to write the song i believe which was the first song we wrote we we sat down at my mum's piano and uh um and i sort of 
I sort of played something on the piano and he was he was like, oh, that sounds like a house piano riff, you know, and, and you know, I played a couple of chords and suddenly it went from, from a, like just a chord, like again, I'm sitting in chairs, it would record like this, to like, to a house chord, like, and it's like, and, uh, and then he just shouted, I believe! And I, and then I got the guitar out and played a big chord on the guitar. And, and, and that was it really. So, you know, from again, from a little bit of a technical piano stuff, it was about the energy, you know, James would just bring that great energy to it. I would like to briefly chat about Unbelievable. I, I, I believe there's kind of a rather funny story behind the creation of that song. And something about a, maybe a late night bike ride and a and a bed sit. Uh, well, yeah. Or so, is that a rumor? No, it, that, 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 you've just about got it right. Um, uh, it, it, there's a little bit of background to this because, as I said, I you know my my previous band had been, you know, we got a record deal. I've been studying art at Oxford University. My band got a record deal. I dropped out of of the art course because I was going to be a, you know, go and go off and, you know, be a superstar. And that was Apple Mosaic. And of course, we never sold any records. It came to nothing. We, uh, and, we end, and then we ended up splitting up. And I was living in this, you know, I couldn't face moving back home to my parents' house. So I got a little bed sit in, in Gloucester where I came from. And, and uh, my, my mum came around and she was like, you know, she burst into tears. You, you've ruined your life. You know, you, you, you had all this. You were at Oxford University. You know, you could have done something, and your, your band's nothing. And, and, uh, and I used to um, cycle from that uh, uh, bedsit to, to my across the park to my mum's house because there was a piano there, and that's where James and I were writing songs. And one of the days I was cycling back, you know, thinking about songs on my bike through the park, and and suddenly, so you know. And, and yeah, my, to add to that, my girlfriend had dumped me at the same time. So all these songs were sort of about her in a way. And, and I was thinking, trying to think of some way to say, you know, you know, you know, the things you say, your purple prose just give you away the things you say. You're unbelievable. And I love that word because it sort of said, oh, you're great. And, you know, there's some you know, bad stuff going on there and maybe some lies or something. And, and, uh, and then the riff came, you know, that just thought of the riff in my head got home, got the guitar out. Right? And recorded it on a cassette, took it to the rehearsal, and, um, and that was it, and Unbelievable was born. And, and, um, and it's just interesting, you know, like at my lowest ebb, when I had nothing, and you, ha you, have, some, you have the most possibilities. And in a funny way, we, you know, and I met, I'd met James and the, the other guys, and we were just, you know, we had endless possibilities. We were having fun, and music was about, you know, being cool and 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 um, just doing what you wanted to do. And and I think all of that is in, in, in unbelievable. You know, it captured that moment. And so, Ian, I want to go yeah. to a quick commercial break, and then I want to come back and talk to you a little bit about some of your current songwriting. Can you stick around till right after the break? I would love to. And we are back with Ian Dench of EMF. So um, we were talking about Unbelievable. Did you guys uh, know or kind of have a feeling that song was going to be the hit while recording it in the studio? Like, was there a feeling with the energy of the song that was like, this is, this is it, we got it? I don't, no, I don't think so. I mean, it was meant to be the, like a cool underground first taste to single. Um, and... We recorded it by itself first with a, um, a great young engineer who hadn't had a hit record before because we were waiting for the big producer to do the album and who was going to do all the hits. And we just spent, you know, a few days, it was only like two or three days recording it. And and um, and I can remember when, it, when, when we finished it, I can remember saying to Jane, I'm not sure if it's right, because we didn't really know quite what we sounded like on record. We'd never done any proper recordings before. Um, 
So, uh, you know, we had no, really no idea. So you guys reached number one in the U.S. with that song. Now, did you already have a tour set for the U.S. at that point, or did the success of that album and that song kind of trigger a, a tour? I, I, no, we had a tour plan. We had, and if, if anything, you know, the, we were playing like a thousand capacity venues, but the day that we started the tour, the record went number one. We, I think we started the tour in Montreal and drove in to the States across the border just as we heard it had gone number one. And we started a six-week tour. We, I think Chicago was the next show. Um, and, you know, we could have probably have done a bigger tour, but everything was sold out, you know, by that time. And, and we just had the best six weeks. You know, we were all, I, I mean, I think I was 25. Uh, um, James and Mark were 21. And Derry and Zach were like 18, you know, 19. And so it was just like, we just had a whale of a time. And, now, you've gone on to have a great songwriting career outside of EMF and have been, and have been writing some notable hits. Uh, a big one for Beyonce and Shakira with Beautiful Liar. How did that opportunity come about? And, and yeah, let, let me ask that first. How did that opportunity come about? Well, uh, when, um, I should mention here, you know, Amanda Ghost. So I've worked with Amanda Ghost a lot. When, when uh, we parted our separate ways with EMF, um, I met Amanda and we started writing um, some songs together uh, for her album and then she met James Blunt wrote You're Beautiful and um, and she said short, shortly after that she got a phone call from someone and she said to me this I just got a phone call from this guy and he says he wants me to write a song for Beyonce and you know, and I just, I can't believe this. So, you know, will you come with me? Let's go and check this guy out. And off we went to this address in New York. We happened to be in New York. And and, uh, um, and we and it was, lo and behold, it was a universal building. We went to meet this guy called Tata Smith. And he's like, yeah, I want you to write a song for Beyonce. And we we're like, well, you know, Amanda sort of went, you know, well, I don't really write songs for other people. You know, I'm, I'm an artist. And I, I, uh, um, you know, and I, that, you know, the James Blunt thing was just a, was just a one-off, you know. And, and he's like, well, hang, no, no, come on. There's somebody I want you to meet. And in walks Beyonce and Jay-Z. And we were like, whoa. And, and Beyonce said, you know, we'd love you to, to write a song. And, and uh, Amanda Becomes like, kind of yeah, tough I, to say no at that point. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, be sh- and, but Amanda said, like, well, you know, I don't really write songs for other people. Maybe I could get to know you and write a song. And Beyonce was like, I'm sorry, I ain't got the time for that. But we've got this great backing track. And, you know, we booked the studio for 8 o'clock tonight. Write us a song. And we were like, whoa. And so Amanda and I went back to the hotel and uh, and wrote Beautiful Liar just there and then. And we went in. A, and that's the first time I think we'd written a song quite so quickly because you know when you're in a band you start an idea you work, try it this way you try it that way and w- that was the first taste of pop songwriting and and so we um which was great fun you know it's something that happened so quickly it's incredible and and then after that we spent a while writing songs we wrote tattoo for jordan sparks um and uh gypsy for shakira and wrote a bunch of songs on on um I am Sasha Fierce, wrote, um, Ave Maria, which was uh, great and had a, had a wonderful time doing that. And, so yeah. was the genre of that album easy for you to write within, or, or I guess was it more or less challenging than some of your other writing projects? I think, I think what I've got um, interested in, and I, and I think why I'm still in the music industry now and what was relevant to everything was I loved about how to try and make the words of songs connect. And I think that was as relevant for EMF as it was for Beyonce. And, and you know, you're trying to be able to connect emotionally with something. And, and so, in a sense, genre is, is immaterial and, you know, you're trying to do something that touches people and you know, I've ended up, I've worked with um, Liam from The Prodigy and uh, um, and Ian Brown, 
from the Stone Roses, just because you want to try and do things that mean something and with pe interesting people and um, and uh, and it was interesting. It was an interesting exercise writing pop songs for for people of that stature that because you're trying to find that that thing that means something to people but it's also sort of personal to the singer and and and, and that was just as relevant for Beyonce and as it was for for you know James and I in in, in EMF well, it's also um, got to sound right coming out of the artist's mouth too you know what I mean yeah. even though they're your words it's still got to match their persona or at least yeah, perceived absolutely. persona that's the truth and i think that's something beyonce was really good at doing she she you know she she'd be like okay play me some songs what you got what you got and if she liked something she was very good at making it her own and and uh she you know she and it would be a, a subtle chain i mean just when she sings it she makes it her own but she'd be like there would be certain lyrics she'd be go i can't sing that that's that's not me and so we'd work on something else um so Ian, um, where can we, where can people go to follow you and EMF? Uh, and is there anything in the, in the works for EMF uh, in the, in the future now? Well, it's our 30th anniversary year. Uh, it, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, Schubert did came out 30 years ago and, uh, we've done a box set. Um, and, uh, if you go to EMF, the band, uh, dot com and Twitter, Instagram. You you can follow us. We're going to do a show in London for our thirty anniversary show in, in uh, December. And James and I are writing some new songs. So hopefully before long, you you will uh, perhaps get some some new EMF. So um, just just yeah, follow us uh, online and and we will have something for you. Um, where can people follow you online? EMF thebands.com uh, uh, and that'll take you to Instagram, Facebook and um, uh, and Twitter which uh, to our um, uh, social media. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen Ian Dench of EMF. Thank you. That is our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. A very special thanks to Ian Dench of EMF for joining us. 